You can't break the laws of physics, but you can go around them. We build a camera. We set out on a journey to capture the unseen, an image that is impossible to capture with any conventional camera. We build a unique large format movie camera with a massive Leica lens that is equivalent to an impossible 29mm f0.3 lens. Come along with us as we explore the connection between lens speed, depth of field and format. Show you how we combined two large format cameras and designed a precise motorized focus system. We take you behind the scenes and show you how we shot our short above and below the surface. And we got so many more interesting things to feed the nerd inside you. Like experimenting with light, exploring forgotten gadgets, and filming with a massive spy plane lens. This epic episode is made possible by Artlist, the inspiring music licensing service that provides virtually all the music to this channel. Like for example, our theme song. Enjoy the ride. The entrance pupil of a lens is what you see when you look into the front of that lens. It is the optical image of the physical aperture of that lens system. In a camera, a lens is a bit like a window to a dark room. The larger the window is, the brighter it can illuminate the room behind it. Of course, that also means that that window will require more glass, gets heavier and gets more expensive compared to a smaller one. If you are a photographer or a filmmaker, you probably know of the relationship between the entrance pupil and the focal length. Let's do this in a nutshell. The F number is the focal length divided by the diameter of the entrance pupil. The F number defines how bright a lens illuminates an area irrespective of the format. The area in which objects are subjectively in focus is called the depth of field. This scene of The Shining is shot at a high F number to allow both characters and the room to appear in focus. This is called a deep depth of field. The lower the F number, the brighter the image is and the shallower the depth of field becomes. We call that a fast lens and it allows shorter shutter speeds with identical exposure. One rarely sees faster lenses than f1 as it gets progressively harder to produce faster lenses that still offer a good quality. It is impossible to build a lens that is faster than f0.5 as long as the lens operates in air or a vacuum for that matter. Practically, you can't really build something faster than f0.7. But how would it look like if you could? In our episode F0.7 Ultrafast Lenses, we step in the footsteps of Stanley Kubrick that used the Zeiss Planar F0.7 to shoot at candlelight. Just like Kubrick, we had to modify our camera to allow for the ultra-short flange required by a massive F0.7 lens capable of illuminating formats beyond full frame. If you missed that one, we strongly recommend to watch it as the images we were able to create were something between unusual and wonderful. Not so much because of the brightness it produced, but because of the crazy shallow depth of field at f0.7. Ever since that experiment, we were looking to break that speed limit and create a depth of field that is even more extreme. Preferably at a wider angle, as that stands out simply because it is just impossible to create with conventional means. f0.5 is the light speed of lens design. You can't break the laws of physics but you can go around them using large formats and the rules known as the equivalency of lenses. The first part of this episode will deal with all the background knowledge that will enable us to build a warp speed camera. Bear with us, we do think that everything we will tell you here is essential to understand what we are doing and it will be worth knowing for every photographer and filmmaker. Our mission is to give you first-class entertainment, so rest assured that we'll make this as entertaining as informative. But if you think you're well-versed in these matters, you can jump forward to the chapter Capturing the Impossible, 
that is all about putting this theory into practice. Let's have a little bit of fun with this one, starting way back. Alexandre Dumas, he wrote The Three Musketeers. Soft-hearted Frenchie. Alexandre Dumas is black. This is the man Dr. Schultz was referring to, Alexandre Dumas, and he was indeed the inventor of The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo. Of course, he was colorized and animated using AI. Filming would have been impossible in those days, as photographers had to expose for long times to compensate for the extremely low ISO of the film plates. For the subjects, that meant that they had to hold still for long times. This animation is based on this photo, taken in 1855. Dumas and especially his hair is blurry, probably because there was some wind in the studio and the movement of the air caused the motion blur. There was a slightly macabre side effect. In Victorian Britain there was a fashion to take photographs with deceased family members, something coined post-mortem photography. The deceased are easily identified in group photos as they don't move and therefore appear sharper. These images may look weird, but the ghostly figures are simply the mothers trying to keep their kids as still as possible for long exposures. Not all historic photographs are taken with large formats. There were all sorts of film plates in sheet sizes, simply because there was no viable way to magnify or reduce an image size during reproduction. The desired size of the photo would dictate the format used to shoot the image, from pocket size to large scale. The desire to show life-size photos of a train produced monstrosities like this camera. Looking at old photos you can often see a relatively shallow depth of field, even in wide shots like this one. The depth of field would require a fast lens if it was taken with a small format. The answer lies within the relatively large format used to take the photo. Let us explain that. This is a simulation of a 29mm f2.8 lens on Super 35. If you change that focal length to 300mm, your image is accordingly zoomed in and darker as the effective f number is falling, meaning that the same amount of light is spread out wider. If we change the format to 8x10, we get the exact same field of view we saw on Super 35. If we enlarge the entrance pupil, so the F number will be F2.8 again, the image has the same brightness again, but also vastly shallower depth of field. When you double the focal length, the depth of field is not half as wide, but a quarter as wide. Bokeh is four times larger compared to a lens with half the focal length at the same F number. As we don't double but tenfold the focal length in this example, the 300mm f2.8 on 8x10 has the depth of field that a 29mm f0.3 lens would have. And that is of course an impossible lens. Another way to understand what we are going to do is to start with the equivalency of lenses. A 25mm f1 on micro for third. A 36mm f1.4 on super 35 a 50mm f2 on full frame, a 100mm f4 on 6x7 medium format aka IMAX and a 350mm f14 on an 8x10 large format will all have the same field of view and the same depth of field. A tiny bit of math reveals the reason. If we transpose the f number equation and if you put all the lens values in, you will see that all the equivalent lenses have the same sized entrance pupil of 25 mm diameter, and that is why they all have the same depth of field. Equivalency of lenses simply means what kind of lens would you need to make it look exactly like another lens format combo in terms of depth of field and field of view. A longer focal length will allow a bigger entrance pupil before the ratio is hitting the physical maximum, and that means that you can generate shallow depth of field if you dare to go there. The larger format size will allow to achieve an identical field of view to the shorter focal length. This is a Sony 300mm lens designed for 8x10 cameras. It has a maximum aperture of f5.6. While that might sound slow to small format users, this is already considered a fast lens in the realm 
and as a result the entrance pupil is much larger than 25mm discussed in the previous example. By the way, a 300mm large format lens is this short compared to a DSLR or mirrorless lens because the bellows of the camera create the required distance to the image plane and not a lens barrel. A full frame equivalent to this lens would be a crazy fast 40mm f0.7. While you probably don't have that in your safe, it would still be a possible lens. But what if we use a very fast 8x10 lens? This is the Lights Hector 300mm f2.8, one of the fastest 300mm lenses to cover 8x10. Lights is the mother company of Leica that stands for Lights Camera. This lens is not Leica branded as it's not from the camera division, but it was designed for 6x7 medium format projectors. And therefore it lacks an iris. It's a true monster of a lens and while it was designed for medium format, it does cover 8x10 large format at infinity. The entrance pupil is huge, meaning it creates an extremely shallow depth of field. The equivalent to this lens on full frame would be a 40mm f0.4 or by cinema standards on Super 35 it would be a 29mm f0.3. Don't get us wrong, the depth of field that the Hector or any other lens produces is the same on every format you put it on. You can simply put it on a full frame camera. By the way, this is the original barrel of the Hector like it was used to sit on the projector. On full frame. 300mm is a telephoto lens and we are used to extremely narrow depth of field in that context and that tiny field of view, just like we are in the realm of macro photography, hardly unusual at all. But if we see the shallow depth of field in a wide shot, it becomes a marvel, simply because we are not used to it and we are not used to it because a lens that could do this cannot exist in common formats. If we are after filming with the depth of field aesthetics of an impossible 29mm f0.3, all we need is our Hector and an 8x10 inch size sensor. And there we are again. Well, there actually are sensors of that size, large sensors some in the program. Those are not an option for us as they are monochrome with very limited video capabilities and they happen to cost $90,000 a piece. What are we going to do? something slightly different. What you got to do is to create a large intermediate image on diffusion and use a smaller format camera to film off that intermediate image. And while that sounds fairly easy, the devil is in the details. To use a larger format to create shallow depth of field is by no means a new idea. It has been done in many varieties for different purposes. As this will come up, no, you can't build a focal reducer to achieve this. Any optical system, focal reducer or not, is bound by the physical limits we talked about. Ultra-fast lenses basically have the reducer already built in. There are two general techniques to create and capture an intermediate image. Both have advantages and disadvantages. You can use an opaque diffusion and project that image on that diffusion. Now you film this projection. It works just like you sitting in the cinema watching the screen. There are two downsides. The taking camera can't be on the optical axis of the lens as it would obstruct the projection. This can be mitigated with tilt shift lenses, but it's always a limiting factor in designing a practical camera. The taking camera is always in the way and you will need a very wide close focus lens to be able to film in the given space. The second downside is that this system loses a lot of light. Only a fraction of the light bounced by the diffusing screen reaches the sensor of the taking camera. The process loses around 6 stops, making it better suited for stills as one can utilize longer exposures. This technique has been used for video before, but one has to film in extremely bright conditions to compensate the light loss and still get a good quality. A camera using this technique is often referred to as a digital obscura, named after a camera obscura. 
right at the start of our journey, we decided that we wanted to build a camera that allows us to film at reasonable ISO, in dim light, and even with slow motion, requiring short exposure times and still deliver a vibrant, high quality image, meaning that a digital obscura wouldn't be our way to go. The second technique uses a ground glass as the intermediate image and the taking camera films the projection from the rear. Ground glass projection is used by some analog cameras to allow the photographer to judge focus. This has the advantage that the taking camera can be on the optical axis of the main lens. This technique is often referred to as a depth of field or shorter DOF adapter. This name comes from DOF adapters like this one that were used on three chip camcorders in the past. The CCDs in these camcorders were tiny and produced a very deep depth of field. To achieve a depth of field comparable to that of 35mm cine cameras, a 35mm lens projects its image on a little ground glass inside the adapter. Problem with this technique is that a ground glass requires to have a structure and this structure becomes visible in the image. DOF adapters cope with this problem by rotating a larger ground glass or like in this case of the Litos 35 by vibrating the ground glass. The quick motion makes the structure disappear like you can see here. Our goal became to build a DOF adapter with a truly large format like 8x10 replicating this old principle. As a basis for the setup, we used the 8x10 Plowbell Pico Profia that we combined with a second 4x5 Pico Profia. An extra 8x10 bellow will keep the side of the taking camera dark. For here now, we're going to leave the bellows away so we can see what is happening. The standard in front will hold the lens and the standard in the back will hold the camera. We cut a metal lens board with a water jet to build a fixture for the Hector lens and we used a Copal 3 board to build a custom EF to E adapter. Both boards are strong enough to carry heavy loads with ease. A large mat box allows us to place 4 by 5.65 filters in front of the Hector. We did play with a large iris to be attached to Hector, but as the iris is not at the entrance pupil and our main goal is to shoot wide open anyways, we decided to control the exposure only with ND. We mount the camera upside down so we see an upright image on our monitors. Of course we could have flipped the image in the monitor, but this would flip the camera interface as well. A rig on the rear standard is for safety and allows the camera to be precisely leveled. Large format cameras like this one are usually focused using the rear standard. This way the entrance pupil of the lens remains in the same place and the perspective doesn't change during focusing. As we don't want to readjust our taking lens with each focus, we will focus with the front standard. So every focus process will always include a dolly movement. With modern system camera lenses, the entrance pupil travels during focusing too but the distance is too small to be noticeable in the image. As the focal length of the large format changes significantly on focus pulls, breathing is massive. But this is not what made us worry. The standard with the lens, rig and the matte box weights 5.5 kg that have to be moved quickly, smoothly, constantly and still very precisely to allow for follow focus or focus ramping in a cinematography context. The original focusing wheels don't allow any of that. Also, the movement of the hand on the wheel introduces visible shaking on the system. Our only option was to construct a motorized focus. For this, we used a linear actuator. Linear actuators transform a rotational movement of an electromotor into a linear motion, for example, to extend or retract a cylinder. This specific one is a servo actuator. It can drive the front standard to any position with a precision of about half a millimeter. Even better, it's always aware of its position and communicate that position to the controller. To be able to use a convenient follow focus, we built a gearbox for the controller knob. The gearing changed the controller knob's imprecise 180 degrees focus throw to something like 500 degrees. This actuator is quite slow and fast focus pulls will cause the actuator to lag behind the input. 
one can choose different gearing actuators that offer faster movement at the price of smoothness, precision and force. We think that with a given task, the less violent movement of the slow actuator is what you should go for. One downside of this focus motor is that it's quite noisy, so it's not suitable if you want to do heavy focus work during a dialogue. Attaching the controller to a field monitor allows us to very precisely judge and pull focus without interfering with the camera at all. We use our ultra bright 21.5 inch OC monitor. Its 1500 nits are so bright and it's so large that it will really help when focusing F0.3 equivalent depth of field in the wild. If you're interested in the OC 21.5 inch ultra bright field monitor, we made a review about it. I'll put a link in the corner. While we're talking about ultra bright, OC was so kind to send us a 7 inch on camera monitor that makes the 1500 nits of the 21.5 inch field monitor look dim in comparison. The OC G7 sports an astonishing 3000 nits. In a dark environment, it's almost painful to look at this monitor at high settings. But of course, you can dim it down. It is very light and offers all the other features that you expect from a modern on cam monitor, except for a touchscreen and it costs $499. If you are interested in the G7, you'll find a link in the description. The secret sauce of a depth of field adapter design is always the ground glass, or better, the ground glass system. This is where the image itself is generated. And no matter how good your taking camera is, flaws that are introduced with a ground glass are practically impossible to solve in post. A large format DOF adapter design introduces a problem that the old DOF adapters like the leaders didn't have. Hotspotting. The more transmissive, aka brighter a ground glass is, the more you can see the bright exit pupil of the lens on the other side. Also, the larger format creates steeper angles for the light towards the edges of the ground glass. This means that the light is more prone to bounce off the ground glass towards the edges. A very strong vignette is the result. So strong that the dynamic range of the camera is not good enough to have enough details in the image and you can't deal with it in post. The answer to these problems is to build a collimator. Hey buddy, you got a dead cat in there or what? In optics, a collimator lens bends incoming light rays, so they are parallel rays. Or vice versa, bending parallel rays to a focal point. An LCD beamer has exactly the same problems we encounter with our ground glass. And it has the solution too. At its heart, an LCD beamer has a transparent image in front of an LCD screen. When you look through the screen, you see the light source in all its harshness, as the screen is unlike a ground glass, not diffusing. But when you look at a projected image from it, it has no apparent vignetting. Why? It solves the problem by collimating the light rays that come from the light source on the imaging screen using a Fresnel lens. On the optical axis of the Fresnel, the light source seems to have been enlarged to the size of the screen. The second collimator Fresnel is placed in reverse in between the LCD screen and the projection lens. The parallel rays get focused back on the projection lens, or in this case the lens of the camera filming this, minimizing the light loss in the system. The focal length of the collimator lenses correspond to the distances between the light source and the screen and the projection lens. We use the exact same technique for our camera. Large format photographers have used Fresnel lenses to brighten their screens for a long time, but usually only on the lens side as the photographer can have different positions and viewing angles. Fresnel lenses have the advantage of being flat and lighter than conventional lenses. In our context, a normal lens would weigh way too much and would be too expensive too. To work, Fresnel lenses require to have groves. The finest grove lenses resemble the surface of a vinyl record. But still, these can be visible in image applications, which is 
why they are usually not used for that purpose. As you can see here, the groves of a record are only visible when they reflect light from the side. As our Fresnel is inside a dark body, it's not a problem. But as light shines through them, a bright direct light can make them visible in the image. We put the Fresnel about half a centimeter away from the ground glass. The taking lens is in close proximity to the ground glass. This, and keeping the taking lens relatively wide open, creates a depth of field inside the camera that is so narrow that the Fresnel groves disappear. Very bright objects can have a mild highlights blooming that are simply the glowing groves that are very blurry. Interestingly, ultra-fast lenses are prone to highlights blooming too, for just completely different reasons. While the large format introduced a new problem, it can solve another one that the old DOF adapters had, the need to move the ground glass. If the structures of the ground glass are fine enough, the grain will become too small to be noticeable. Obviously, we cannot use the original ground glass as it has markings. Also, the grain is far too large for our use case. We tried a variety of projector foils and even optical grade ground glass by Atmons Optics in combination with wax, but we got by far the best results using a custom made ground glass by Raphael Felix Gut, who spent 7 hours grounding the glass with traditional techniques by hand. If you are in need for a good, super fine ground glass or other large format related products, drop him a line with greetings from us. I'll put a link in the description. Combining the ultra bright ground glass with our color meter Fresnels gave us the image we were looking for. Raphael's ground glass structures are indeed so small that they nearly disappear in the final image. While our Franken camera is way more light effective than the front projector systems we talked about earlier, we still estimate a light loss of about three stops, meaning that Hector's f2.8 become an effective T8. While that sounds dramatic, Let's see what we can create at 800 ISO, 40 frames per second and 180 degree shutter. And believe it or not, we used ND filters in all shots. This is the Ion C, completely shot with a depth of field and field of view equivalent to that of a 29mm f0.3 on a movie camera. Staring at the floor like it is staring back I know we've been through this before But I keep turning back Interpreting to not the lies That paralyze me where I stand The words that say you separate the dark from light They say you raised the dead and gave my love the breath of life And I believe you have to fall And I believe you will in me
I hope you enjoyed this little tech demonstration. If you experience strong bending, it is in the nature of the underwater shots that really make them look horrible with 8-bit and the high YouTube compression. This is why we also released an HDR version that can handle subtile darkness much better. So, if you are experiencing strong bending, please watch the HDR version. Our attempts to grade the footage to HDR and make it look good on YouTube were, let's say, insufficient. So I'm very happy to have gotten help from a new friend of the media division, Filippo Cinotti from Plasma Production. He graded the short in HDR that assigns way more data to the shadows and improves the experience. If you want to watch that, I'll put a link in the corner and in the description. Thanks a ton, Filippo. We appreciate your expertise and effort. Check out his professional colorist masterclasses. I'll put a link in the description. Be aware that this will only work on devices that support YouTube HDR. Make sure to come back after that, because we are going to take you behind the scenes and discuss some interesting stuff we learned along the way. Content like this is very hard and expensive to produce. Experimenting and planning for this episode alone took over a year and consumed countless days and nights and considerable resources to buy large format cameras, uh, lenses, motors, controllers. All of this is only possible because of the support of kind and generous viewers. Please give us a like if you think that you deserve one and leave us your thoughts in a comment. If you're not subscribed to the media division, please consider doing that. All that helps us to convince YouTube that high quality long form content is something that has a place on the platform and more importantly, in the hearts of our audience. If you really want to make a difference and support independent quality content made for you, you can become a member of the media division. We offer three tiers of membership that offer different perks. With the Scott membership tier, you can show us some love and support our mission for 99 cents per month. Lynch members can get our action packs that are released with every episode containing related stuff like footage, LUTs and project files to use in their own projects. The Kubrick tier is our pro tier. Besides having access to all the action packs, past and present, you will get personal consultation. If you want us to show or explain things in a Zoom call, we can do that. We are happy to share our experience with you. As a special treat for this episode and so we don't have to answer the same questions 100 times, we have a satellite episodes for all our members, including Scott members. In Making a Monster, we go way deeper into the design of our Death of Field camera and the components that we used and how we assembled them. Just everything you need to know if you want to build something like this on your own. And if you are a Kubrick member, we are happy to walk with you through personally too. For those who are not fans of HDR and who want to see the footage like it was intended in our SDR grade or maybe even want to try their own vision of the grade, our Kubrick and Lynch members will also get their action packs for this episode. It contains all the footage used for the INC as 6K ProRes HQ in log with the resolved timeline, meaning that you have all the grades, LUTs and so on to play around with. This episode was not only made possible by our members, but also with the help of Artlist, which were kind enough to sponsor this episode. I cannot thank them enough, not only for sponsoring this episode, but for providing a service that became essential to our work. If you're a filmmaker, or a creator, or an ambitious hobbyist, you know how important music is to capture the attention on the hearts of the audience. Virtually all the music that you hear on our channel is from the Artlist catalog. We chose Artlist as a service right from the beginning because it not only provides subscribers with a peace of mind that the licensing model gives, but also because of the quality of their catalog. Artlist provides an always improving huge catalog of 22,000 ready to use music tracks and 27,000 sound effects for all kinds of projects, moods and tastes. Subscription with artists will allow you to use all the music and sounds in their catalog without having to go through hassles with licensing single music tracks for specific projects. Also, Artlist doesn't lock you into your subscription. If you ever choose to cancel, all the music that you published with your projects can remain published in any media. You can immediately tell that Artlist really understands what music works for every given purpose. Artists and titles are hand-picked 
I've yet to find any track in the vast catalogue that is not good in its very own way. You discover music and artists that not only carry your vision, but inspire that vision in the first place. It happened many times for us. The haunting energy of Jay Jarrett's epic soundtracks created the mood for so many of our projects, long before the first shot was made or even a draft was written. Like in the intro of a scope series. Or with this track that sounds and feels like the strange glass we tested in our episode about ultrafast glasses. It is amazing how one can stumble across something weird, beautiful, cool or even silly in the artless catalogue. And that mood will unfold into a whole concept for a feature, commercial, how-to video, social media video, podcast or whatever you want to create. Artlist has just the right track to make your projects fly. If you work with a music platform before, you might know how hard it can be to find that right track. Artlist provides filter to search for the right mood, the theme of your video, genre, instruments, duration, you name it. But way beyond that, Artlist features curated lists called Spotlights that are inspired by a use case, a season or a blockbuster. And those are priceless. You want your film to sound like you? There's a list for that. We have been inspired by the fantastic Stranger Things Spotlight many times. Or by the Squid Game Spotlight that provided the soundtrack for our GH6 film Hypnogosia. With all that hyper-creative input, we also really appreciate that Artless makes the profane so easy. If you just need music that works to talk over, there's a spotlight for that. We could talk on and on about Artless and how it became an essential part of our work, but it is better if you just try for yourself. It was never easier to recommend a service for us. If you are a professional user and you want to use titles from the Artless catalog for your client work, commercials or features, the Creator Pro plan is right for you and it starts at $16.60 per month. If you are a creator or influencer, it's even cheaper. For only $9.99 per month, you're free to use the Artlist catalog for all your social media channels. Thank you, Artlist. And thank you for being creators at heart yourself, supporting our mission to create edutainment for the community. Now let's go behind the scenes of the INC, which will give us the opportunity to describe our experience and our learnings with a very unique set of tasks. We shot the underwater sequences first, and as you surely guessed by now, we didn't really take the camera underwater. We shot all those scenes in a pool that has windows under the waterline. One to the side, and one at its head, where we placed the camera. The lens and everything is already calibrated and just with a gaff tape set to the focus where it needs and I have little markings here that at least give me a rough idea where it needs to be to really be spot on because if you have to focus on the ground glass there's just like one millimeter uh, of, of uh, room that you have. If you're wrong you start seeing the uh, Fresnel lens uh, groves and that you have that on both sides of the game so you really have to be careful with that. We wanted to do something that really really gives you the feeling of depth and of course this is a tiny tiny pool and as most pools are uh, it is bright inside and that would be a dead giveaway that you can uh, that it's a pool and not a lake. So what we did is we put some covers in it. Uh, it's just a cover that you would put over a boat in the harbor when you don't use it over the winter or something like that. Uh, and it's dark enough to, to do exactly what we want, to just cover the background. As we have a narrow uh, field of view, uh, we don't need to do the whole thing, but just the back was enough for this. Uh, the very, very shallow depth of field that we have with the equivalent of f0.3 will have the advantage that it blurs out so quickly that you can't even say, see the larger folds or some reflection or whatever because it's really not black, it's, it's, it's gray. And when sun directly hits on it, you can actually see it quite well. We also have a second cover uh, that we just spawn right uh, over 
the whole pool to avoid direct sunlight. Uh, not so much because it, the look wasn't right, but it's not stable at all. So you have a cloud, you don't have a cloud, and then the, the sun moves from right there over there over the whole day. And uh, that is just not what you want. So for the lighting concept, we try to emulate the natural light by placing all of our powerful light sources on this side. So this is our key side, and we try to backlight the uh, main character or the actor and we use the reflective tiles to get a natural uh, fill. To underline the surrealistic part of the story we try to give the actor a side light and uh, we did this by placing uh, aperture P300 and pushed it through the other window of the pool. Besides giving us a meaningful performance, the job of our talent Max was to hold his breath and stay buoyant long enough to give us time to focus. This sounds easy as it is, but with the help of some basic scuba diving techniques, Max managed to constantly improve throughout the day and deliver some very nice performances. As to be expected, focus was a challenge given the narrow depth of field. Focus had to be adjusted almost permanently. Our focus system proved itself and focusing stayed surprisingly manageable throughout the day. Orientation in the pool was a problem. Max couldn't see where the lens of the camera was from within the pool, but his position was essential to get the right framing. Holding a flashlight close to the window gave Max the navigation and help he needed. One of the unexpected problems was for Max to stay warm. Even though we shot this in summer, the water in the pool was quite cold, making it progressively harder for Max to suppress shiver. We shot everything at 40 frames per second, and playback at 24 frames per second helps to stretch the takes a bit. Thanks to Max's commitment and high pain threshold, we managed to get all the shots we needed. Thank you, Max. Very early on the next morning, we shot the scenes at the lake, and to Max's delight, it was relatively warm. Here in the forest, we tried to do some focus pulls. And again, with only a few attempts, we managed to keep Max in the ridiculously thin focus plane, with lovely surreal results, proving once more that one should try before giving up. Of course, all shots took a lot of repetition to nail focus, timing, acting, filming is always an endurance feat and a mission to overcome unexpected problems. Filmmaking is hard work and requires commitment and muscle power. It is to the credit of our collaborator Max and our talent Maximilian that we got it done. We planned for Maximilian to wander into the lake to get a better transition, but the lake was closed for swimming due to blue-green algae at the time. So, unfortunately for us and fortunately for Maximilian, we had to keep our feet dry. As always, we do this kind of projects to explore principles and theories, ultimately to get better grasp of them, but also because it's simply fun for us. And hopefully for you too. If you think that independent high quality content like this should exist and you don't want to commit with a membership, you can make a one-time donation using YouTube Super Thanks. The button is on the right side under the video. See it as a ticket to the movies where you decide what to pay. Every donation helps us continue our mission. And if you can't spend any money, please spread the word. Thank you. Let me address a couple of thoughts we came across during this project. Just out of curiosity, we wanted to see how different the fast Hector would look compared to a lens that was actually designed for an 8x10 camera. And here we are going to use the Nikon 300mm f5.6 that we talked about earlier. This is the Hector with its wildly narrow depth of field and a somewhat swirly bokeh. This is the Nikon 300mm. Besides the obviously deeper depth of field, equivalent to a 40mm f0.7 on full frame, you might see that unlike the Hector, it produces a very flat focal plane. The Hector produces a very curved focal plane, making it not really suitable for something like architecture. But in a forest, this problem is not so obvious as the trees don't grow in one plane. 
we think the Hector just doesn't have a field flattener element, as the much smaller 6x7 it was designed for only uses the sweet spot of the lens. Everything we did today raises one question. Can one go even larger than we did? And does it make sense to do so? We use this massive 990mm f8 air reconnaissance lens. Early versions of the B2 spy plane were equipped with these lenses, where they have been used to make wide-angle shots of the ground. Yes, as we learned today, depending on the format, 990mm can deliver a wide-angle field of view, and while f8 sounds slow, the massive entrance pupil alone tells you what to expect. This will easily cover a 1 square meter ground glass, and you would need a 20mm f0.2 lens to match that depth of field and field of view on Super 35. The ground glass would have to be much thicker and it would still be very fragile, so we experimented with plastic diffusion. F8 would have made the spot illumination and therefore the filming of the projection much harder. We didn't follow through to build this camera, as the sheer size and the weight of the system would have made it super hard to handle. Overall, there was nothing in the image worth the hassle, and we think that for our purpose, the 8x10 is kind of a sweet spot. Some of you might have been thinking all along, why not simply use tilt-shift lenses uh, instead of such a painfully complex process? Of course, you can create extreme shallow depth of field effects by changing the orientation of the focal plane relative to the image plane. Tilt shift doesn't really create a shallow depth of field, it just changes the orientation of the depth of field. The results are very different. In specific situations one can use a tilt shift to get sorts of similar effects, and in those tilt shift is certainly the way to go. As our camera is based on a regular 8x10 camera, all the standards still freely tilt and shift and rotate so you can easily combine the super shallow depth of field with tilt shift effects if you want those. You probably heard it a million times. The large format look is hailed by many photographers and filmmakers. So is there an intrinsic difference between the look of a larger and a smaller format? The short answer is no. But as usual, it's not quite that simple. You can shoot with 8x10 or a tiny phone sensor. There's no change in perspective or optical compression, regardless of the format in use. Perspective is only the distance between the subject and the camera. You can argue that a larger format offers potentially better image quality given a larger sensor or negative but that is always in relation to the entrance pupil of the lens, light, ISO, and many other factors, none of which are really intrinsic to a format. Even things like distortions are not more or less intrinsic to any format. Larger formats do allow for higher resolutions at a lower F number due to the Nyquist effect, but that doesn't affect an image in an ordinary context, and is that really what they are talking about when they mention the look? The one thing is the potential for shallower depth of field. But you would have to go quite large in terms of format and wide in terms of aperture to arrive at a look that is impossible on a smaller format. If you want to call this an intrinsic difference, I'll leave that to you. Practically, you will often arrive at different results given different formats. Especially analog, large format photography has its value because of the vastly different process. It's just like slow food in a kitchen or listening to a record instead of mp3 on a phone. Working in that way forces a different perspective that is conducive to creating art. It is just a bit annoying when people praise the large format look, comparing two digital formats that are very close to each other and in situations where it barely matters, if at all. Before you're on your way, hopefully watching some more of our epic episodes like our episode about Canon FD lenses, revisiting aliens, or The Shining, exploring size super speeds, or about motion control and how we created our intro, 
or learn everything there is to know about Anamorphic with our epic scope series spoofing Blade Runner. In any case, thank you for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe. I would like to thank all of our partners that made this episode possible. I want to thank my collaborator Max Hahn for realizing the INC together with me. This valuable expertise, talent, additional equipment and sheer body power allowed us to push much further than we would have been able otherwise. He also shot the behind the scenes footage of this episode. I want to thank the actor Maximilian Heinemann for playing our man that dove to the bottom of the lake to find himself. Thank you to Paul Schumann and the Marmalade. They enabled us to shoot the awesome gear shots using the spike motion control system and the studio. Colorist Filippo Cinotti from Plasma Production for the HDR version of the INC. Raphael Felix Gut for creating our super bright ground glass. If you want to collaborate with any of our partners, you will find links to their website or social media accounts in the description. We would like to thank Artlist one more time. Without them, we could have invested the time and energy to make this episode happen. We really appreciate their passion to inspire and educate all creators and filmmakers. If you want to drop by and show them some love, check out their spotlights. And get some inspiration, there's a link in the description. Now it is time to worship our Kubrick members. They are the core of this channel and their financial support enables us to think big and approach projects like this one. At the time of finalizing this episode, the following Kubrick members supported our channel. A. Wexler, A51 Pictures, Andrus Agaskov, Andy Lynn, Aravia Battis, Alex B, B. Kelly, Bat, Bob Drummond, Brandon von Beekham, Chris Brad Jones, Ed Haggerty, Ethan Hegel, Eugenio Triana, H3 FF01, J. Riley Holt, Jacob Thomas Scott, J. Highway, Jeff Mitchell, Kevin X, Krasimir Knezevich, Lukas Medriski, mm. Manix Gabor, Max Kane, Maximilian Willard, Michael Heidecker, Michael Tibinka, Mick Lexington, Miguel Villa, Nick Martin, Nolan Putton, P. Horton, Pascal Despa, Peter Pavlov, Peter Poz, Pixie, Premium Paris, Raul Queris, RJ Permenter, Rob Yale, Sebastian Rooks, Skinny Kid, Srabble, Stefan Sostrom, Stevie Welsh, Stephen Caban, Stephen Cameo, Stephen Z, The Black Douglas, Tony Watimena Colorist Filmmaker, Victor van Dagon, VS, Yankip. Thank you. This video is for you. Of course we love all our members and thank them with all of our nerdy hearts. Thank you for supporting independent quality content made for you. The division salutes you. My name is Nicholas and until next time, I'm signing out with Nerdalicious Wishes. Shoot something amazing. <laughs>